Welcome, everyone. I'm Dale Gann. I'm the president of the Greater Denver Gym and Mineral Council. And I want to thank you for coming today. Our next speaker is Dr. Lou Taylor. He is a paleontologist with the Denver Museum. Correct? That's right. Okay. And today he's going to be giving a talk on recent and past uh, fossil discoveries here in the state of Colorado. So if you'd all give Lou a warm welcome. Thank you. My intent today is to go through various fossil sites in Colorado to show you the different kinds of fossils and the fossils of different ages, and in some cases, how, how and why they are significant. Old and new implies both recently discovered fossil sites, but it also implies geological age. So I've chosen to go through the fossil sites of Colorado, beginning with the earliest sites in uh, the Cambrian. If you're familiar with the work of Kirk Johnson and Ray Troll, you've seen this map, and it shows a number of the different kinds of fossils that come from Colorado. Colorado has a great diversity of fossils from all over the state. Um, I recommend that you find their book called uh, The Fossil Freeway, which is a very interesting read and has a lot about Colorado fossils and Colorado fossil collectors. I'm going to go through in the geological time sense, beginning with the Cambrian, and the little red arrows point to Colorado, so you can see what our situation is at, at the time that map represents. Here we see that in the Cambrian, we are covered to a great extent by seaway, so one would expect that the rare fossils that are found in Colorado might be creatures from the sea. Here we find in the Sawatch Formation over by Leadville and along the Front Range down by Deckers, a series of trilobite fragments. I don't know of any nice complete trilobites from this area, but the trilobite fragments are really well known and they are identifiable. And they of course have been published since the, uh, before this paper in the night, almost the 1960s. The Ordovician is a time we're also covered to a great extent by the sea, and as a result, we find animals along shorelines and we find them in some deeper water. There are some very important Ordovician fossils found in Colorado. The Harding Sandstone down by Canyon City contains these strange looking fossils. These are actually types of fish scales from a fish that look very much like this. These are the, the bony fishes of the, of the Ordovician. These are known worldwide because they represent some of the earliest fish ever known. And those fish were first discovered here in Colorado. They were published by uh, Denison of the Field Museum in Chicago back in the 1960s. Incidentally, when I started in vertebrate paleontology, this is the first fossil that I was shown, were Eraptichius and Asteraspus. Also from the Harding Sandstone, there's an abundance of conodonts, and these have been known and described since the 1930s, but nobody knew what they were. Conodonts were very useful in a biostratigraphic sense. That is, they could tell us where we were in geological time, but it didn't make any difference what they were. They were just different enough, and we found enough of them that they would tell us how old the rocks are. Finally, I believe in Scotland, someone found the creature that had these. These are teeth of a pre-vertebrate kind of organism that lived during the uh, Ordovician. Also in the Harding Sandstone are a number of trackways. These invertebrate ichnofossils are found on the Thorson Ranch east of uh, Canyon City. They were described and, and explained by Bill Fisher, who at the time was at Colorado College. And these markings that you see along here, and over here, and here, are left on the shallow seafloor by creatures like Eurypterids, like this animal that 
he came up with on the, uh, in his uh, 1978 publication. Carly Thorson will gladly show you these fossils. They're still on private property if you give her, I think it's five or $10. She'll take you back to this locality in her four wheeler and, and spend an afternoon showing you what's there. Into the Devonian. Here you can see that we also are covered by seaway. And the Devonian is a time of also bony fishes, but much larger bony fishes. Linda Soar, working with a group from the uh, Western Tier of Paleo Society, found this fragment which fits into the jaw of a Dunkleosteus. And a Dunkleosteus, this Devonian fish, is known because of its size. This jaw is about three feet wide. If you go to the museum downtown and you walk into the beginning of prehistoric journey, there is, this skull is mounted there. And this is a monstrous fish. It's interesting because one, it's from the Devonian, but secondly, it's not very well known from Colorado. This is a very rare find to find something like this. Dunkleosteus is named after David Dunkel, who was the curator at the museum in Cleveland. It was found when they're building I-90 through Ohio. It's hardly known from any place else, but we have it in the, the flat tops. They're still looking for more of this and they haven't found too much. Notice that this thing has no teeth. This has sharp, bone so that the jawbone is actually razor sharp on its edges. There's no, no separate teeth. It just clamps down on whatever it is that it's eating with its jaw. The Mississippian is represented by a lot of shale in Colorado, but there isn't very much in the way of fossils. Near Dotsero, if you take the road no that drives north of Dotsero that goes past the volcano and in that area, there's a black shale there, which I think is called the Gilman Formation, or it's a part of the Gilman Formation. And if you dig through that, you may find some fossil fish scales. That's the only thing I've ever seen that came out of the, out of the Mississippi. And most of the Mississippi in here is, is dolomite up around Leadville and, and is uh, associated with the mining. The Pennsylvanian, we know the Pennsylvanian because it's just to the west of Denver, the Red Rocks Amphitheater sits in the Pennsylvanian. But there are also fossils from, from the Pennsylvanian. There's a, a large fossil assemblage that comes from the Minturn Formation up around McCoy. So if you take go north of uh, I-70 up toward McCoy, a fellow named Wayne Itano, who is a actually a physicist, but who's an avocational paleontologist, has found a number of specimens like this. This is the spine from the dorsal fin of a shark, Pennsylvanian shark. Wayne has identified and written about all of these sharks, which he's found specimens of, sometimes fragmental, from uh, up near Minturn. Minturn is also known for it's uh, elongated orthoceras type ammonite creatures. It's got some snails. It has some fragments of, uh, of crinoids. These are the, the long stemmed animals that live in the, in the uh, Paleozoic Ocean. There's also some trilobites known. Again, not the whole trilobite, just the, the pygidium, the tail portion. Wayne's also found some plant specimens from up in that area. The Minturn is also significant because it contains an animal we don't think about very much, fusilinids. These are important to the oil business because fusilinids, and these creatures are small. These, are, these photographs are taken through a microscope. These may be a millimeter across at its largest. There's one specimen that's three inches long but these are single-celled organisms that have a, uh, a coiled test or shell. They're significant because they only existed in the Pennsylvania and in the Permian, and they evolved very rapidly, so they're great stratigraphic markers. 
You not only, if they come out of an oil well, you can tell not only that you're in Pennsylvania rocks, you can tell where in the Pennsylvania in time you are. They're really significant, but fossil collectors rarely see them. Into the Permian, the end of the, the uh, Paleozoic, this one surprised me. There are Permian reptiles and Permian amphibians in Colorado. I was not aware of this until a few days ago. These specimens are normally known from the red beds of West Texas. This specimen, where are we here? Whoops, wrong one. This specimen is an amphibian that was actually found. This specimen is from West Texas, but there's been specimens of it that are found from Colorado over by Placerville in the Cutler Formation. The reptiles that are found are animals like the Dimetrodon, which is also down in the lower right. And there's also some animals that we now call synapses. There was a time when these were called mammal-like reptiles, but they're now referred to as non-mammalian synapsids, so they belong to the same overall group that, that uh, mammals do. Closer to home, up here near lions, and perhaps in the patio that you built maybe 20 years ago, in the lions formation, there are tracks. There we go. These are tracks of a small reptile. These tracks are only about the size of, they're smaller than a quarter. But this is an animal that walked up the sand dunes of the lions formation back in the Permian time. Now the people who sell the lions for patios and, and buildings don't sell this. They all pull them aside. But in past years, when I taught classes at the Denver Museum, I would occasionally have a student who'd say, oh, I have some of those in my backyard. They're in my patio. I bought them. The house was built in maybe in the 60s. The Triassic. We're in the middle of the Mesozoic period, and the Triassic, you can see that we are mostly terrestrial in Colorado, but we do have a shoreline that comes and goes. We find over in uh, uh, the Eagle Basin, again around the Minturn area, we find bones of what are called proto-dinosaurs. These are not taxonomically dinosaurs, but they are early forms of the dinosaurs. These were discovered a few years ago by uh, Brian Small and Jeffrey Martz. Brian Small used to be the curator at the, the Denver Museum. And this is one that they named uh, Quanisaurus William Parker I. And Bill Parker is the paleontologist where there's a lot of Triassic beds down in the Petrified Forest in Arizona. Again, those are found mostly outside of Colorado. It was a bit of a surprise to find them. A rare fossil that shows up in the uh, lichens formation, which overlies the lions, are stromatolites. And stromatolites are cyanobacterial layers, and you can see this pattern. This is the inside of a stromatolite that was formed on the sea edge during the Triassic time. You can see these today in a few places, most famously in Shark Bay, Australia. This is an area um, in northwestern Australia where as the tide comes and goes, these stromatolites are growing there. So if you cut one of these into, cut into one of these, you would see the same pattern that you see in the Triassic. This was the main reason that a few years ago, I traveled from places like Sydney to go up into this really far out place where the airport's about half the size of this room <laughs> to see these, uh, these stromatolites as they were growing. I don't think any paleontologist doesn't have this on a bucket list someplace. The Jurassic. Colorado is world famous for its Jurassic fossils. You say the word Jurassics and every kid in the world knows dinosaurs. 
Colorado is known for a number of early dinosaurs, that is, early found dinosaurs. Some of the first dinosaurs in the world were found in Colorado. Colorado became a locality that was important to the, the uh, late 1800s bone wars between uh, Edwin Drinker Cope and both Neil Charles Marsh, and they, they stole from each other's quarries and they hired each other's workers and they just did all sorts of bad things in the press. They made it very difficult for we modern vertebrate paleontologists because they'd find different parts of the same animal and give them different names. And it was up to the rest of the world to put it all back together. We in Colorado have had a series of streams which were flowing up to the northeast through a number of millions of years of the, of the uh, Jurassic to create what we know as the Morrison Formation. Most of the dinosaurs that kids go gaga over come from the Morrison. And they were found here in Colorado. Some of them were found on Dinosaur Ridge. This is the type section for the Morrison Formation, or at least one member of the Morrison Formation. But as you can see, the Morrison has, is a system of deposition, and it covers parts of 13 states and goes up into Canada. Not all of the Morrison has dinosaurs in it, but that's only because people haven't looked in it. They found it in one little thin member, and so that's where everybody concentrated. Jim Kirkland from over in Utah is starting to look in above and below that, that little horizon, and by golly, he's finding more dinosaurs. Some sites that most any dinosaur aficionado is familiar with, the Purgatory Trackway, Garden Park in Canyon City, Dinosaur Ridge to the west of us, and the deposits over near Fruita in western Colorado. It's over in western Colorado where Elmer Riggs, who was a paleontologist at the Field Museum in Chicago, found the very first Brachiosaurus. This was a gigantic creature. Its size just was stupendous to anybody who first came in contact with it. And here you can see, like so many people who find big bones, they lay down and have a picture taken next to it. This is a, a, uh, a humerus. So this is an arm, a front arm bone of the uh, Brachiosaurus. They found enough of it and put together from other, other specimens that if you go to O'Hare Airport and walk through, I think this is Terminal B, as you come up through from the tunnel, this is right, in, right ahead of you. They've made a cast of Brachiosaurus and it's there standing in the airport. I've spent a lot of time in delays looking at this specimen to see, see, what, see what it's all about. Elmer Riggs was, spent a lot of time in the western Colorado, in the Fruita area, around Grand Junction. He also is responsible for finding the first Apatosaurus. Kids know Apatosaurus as Brontosaurus. There are two different animals now. There was a time when they were only called Apatosaurus. Apatosaurus is also, of course, a movie star. This is Apatosaurus in one of the uh, Jurassic Park movies. I think this is the Jurassic, Jurassic World. It gives you an idea of the size of these creatures. And they're important because once these were found in Colorado, people started to look elsewhere. We now know Brachiosaurus from the Tendigaru beds in Tanzania in Africa. <coughs> so we find animals of the same age in different places. <coughs> Colorado has prompted a lot of great discoveries. Dinosaur Ridge, west of, of uh, Denver, a place that I've become very fond of over the years. I sat on the board of directors out there and was actually the interim director for a few months, a couple of years, five years ago now. <laughs> a couple of years goes by pretty fast. But the bones that were found there were found by Arthur Lakes, who was a, a teacher at, oh, thank you, who was a teacher at the, uh, what's now the Colorado School of Mines. And he was up looking for fossil leaves and he came across some large bones. 
and he had the foresight to send those bones to O.C. Marsh, who was at Yale and was one of the two prominent vertebrate paleontologists in the country. And some of the bones that he sent to Marsh were identified by Marsh as Stegosaurus. So we can say that the first Stegosaurus known in the entire world, the published Stegosaurus, was found on Dinosaur Ridge, on the west side of Dinosaur Ridge. The first one in the world. I don't, who knows what it would have been called if, if it had been named someplace else. The second one also came from Colorado. Some people say it was the first one, but it wasn't published early enough. It came from Canyon City. So Stegosaurus is, is well known. And you can see that over the years, people have different ways of, of depicting Stegosaurus. This is one of the most, where are we? One of the most recent We'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is the, the specimen that is mounted in Prehistoric Journey at the museum. You may know that Stegosaurus is the Colorado state fossil. How do things become a state fossil? Well, in this case, Jordan Sato's wife, Ruth, many of you may know Jordan, who's a, a well-known collector in the, in the Denver area. Unfortunately, he just died last year, but his wife was teaching school and she decided to do a lesson on how a bill became a law. So her students, one of their students' mothers was in the Colorado legislature, so she introduced a bill to make Stegosaurus the state fossil. Kids were all excited. The legislature turned them down for three years. Finally, Governor Lamb, after the kids sent him letters, they had t-shirts made, they really put forth a big effort. Governor Lamb in 1980, 1982 signed a proclamation making Stegosaurus the state fossil. And it was all due to a group of fourth graders who by the time it happened were eighth graders. They got a good lesson in how a bill becomes a law. <clears throat> Down in Canyon City, there are a number of uh, dinosaur quarries that were also found in the late 1800s, and O.C. Marsh was also involved in, in them. Uh, he worked with a fellow named Felch, who actually discovered the bones, and they worked in, in what is now called Marsh Felch Quarry, Felch Quarry Number 1, and this spot right here, which is also in their original... Oh, I lost it. In their, there we go. Their original, um, their original quarry is where the Stegosaurus came from down in Canyon City. Also from the Felch quarries, there were a number of these large creatures known in some cases for the first time. Also a very small dinosaur called Othnelia, named after O.C. O.C. Marsh. Cope named it Othnelia, uh, Marsh, yeah, Cope named it Othnelia after Marsh, and Marsh ultimately named a creature after, uh, Cope named a creature after Marsh, and he called it Copator. This specimen up here at the top, Marapunasaurus, is, as you can see, much larger than all of the other large sauropods. This animal was found in Canyon City, but has become a ghost dinosaur. No one knows where it is. We'll talk about it in a minute. Diplodocus, some of you may know from the Denver Museum, this is how Diplodocus was mounted in the Denver Museum when I first came to Denver in, I think I visited the museum in 1972. This was in the, in the Denver Museum, the tail was dragging on the ground. And when they did Prehistoric Journey, Ken Carpenter remounted that same specimen in the modern interpretation fashion. So if you go to the dinosaur, or go to Prehistoric Journey in the museum, you now see this tail way up over your head. The same specimen, he just mounted it two different ways based upon uh, modern research. 
Cope also worked down in Canyon City, and this is a picture of one of his quarries, and you can see the large number of bones which are found as they were excavating. And they, again, were finding these very large sauropod dinosaurs. And you can see a number of them here, Camarasaurus, Camptosaurus, also Stegosaur fragments, uh, and Amphicelius. Amphicelius is this creature. This is the large one in the other diagram. Cope had a short publication, I think in 1898, if I remember correctly, and this is the vertebrae of what he called Amphicelius fragilimus. Ken Carpenter, who was the preparer at the Denver Museum at the time, along with volunteer Tony De, Tony De Croce, put, put Cope's measurements into actuality, and they created a model of this vertebrae that Cope had said was this big. Well, Ken has gone back through, and he said, ah, this is just too big to be real. He's still using Cope specimens, but he's widened it a little bit and made it a little bit shorter. And he now has renamed Amphicelius and calls it Marapunisaria. This, this vertebrae, incidentally, has wandered from the museum down to Canyon City and is currently on display out at Dinosaur Ridge in their Trek Through Time exhibit. It, of course, poses a big problem and, and a big question. Did, it, did this animal really exist? Was it this big? The vertebrae apparently turned to dust while it was being shipped to the American Museum. The container that it was in was given an American Museum in New York specimen number, but there's no specimen. <laughs> so nobody knows how big was it really. It did exist, but what was it is the question. Also in the Garden Park area down in Canyon City, a few years ago, uh, Brenda Johnson and Angie Mathias, who are WIPS members working through the museum, went into a recently discovered dinosaur egg site. They collected material and sieved it, and they found some small mammals along with the dinosaur eggs. In fact, they came up with the first Mesozoic mammals along the front range. They found an animal called a triconodont, and they also found a multituberculate specimen. Multituberculates and triconodonts aren't very well known other than by uh, paleomammalogists, but the multituberculates, as little known as they are, are very important in the fossil record, and it's significant to find some along the, the front range with the dinosaurs. They're good at telling where you are in time because these animals were the longest lived or order of mammals ever. They lived from the Jurassic into the end of the Oligocene. So they lived through the boundary of the, the uh, crater impact, the impact crater, and they evolved rapidly enough that again, you can use them in a biostratigraphic context. They were the pre-rodent rodents. They were gnawing on dinosaur bones. And they are also, um, they're known from around the world. So they are significant both in time and in location. These are the strange teeth of the monotuberculus. This is a, a blade-like portion of a blade-like premolar. And these, these specimens are maybe a millimeter across at the greatest. So they found dinosaur eggshell, they found dinosaur teeth, small, they found a few fish teeth, and they found these triconodont, triconodont teeth. These are not the first triconodonts from Colorado, there's been some from western Colorado, but they're the first ones that have shown up on the, on the front range. And they're significant because they tell us what kinds of animals lived here.
There's also evidence of dinosaurs in southern Colorado, not bones. Well, there are some bones there, but it's famous for the Purgatory Trackway. Purgatory is a bastardization of the original name the French gave it, the Purgatoire. It was the Purgatoire River. It's now Purgatory, or sometimes called Picket Wire. And Martin Lockley, shown here in the upper right, spent a lot of time in the 1970s and 1980s studying and documenting this trackway. There are over 1,300 dinosaur tracks along the Purgatory River. And every year, the people who are responsible for this area work at Comanche National Grasslands, have crews of volunteers who come down and clean out the tracks from the spring floods that have filled them with mud. And you can see they're often filled with, uh, filled with water. There are some bones from the area. Also, uh, one of the, one of the uh, dinosaurs that was known from here is a Patasaurus. This is a scapula from a Patasaurus found at at uh, what Bruce Schumacher, who was the director of the, the uh, Comanche National Grasslands uh, at the time, found it at what he called the last chance of dinosaur quarry. And you can see they found quite a number of bones in the red on the, on the quarry map, the largest of which was this scapula, which is also now a cast of it on display out at uh, Dinosaur Ridge. The Morrison Formation had more than dinosaurs. Steve Hasiotis from the University of Kansas a few years ago wrote about termite mounds that he found down in the Morrison of, of uh, more southern Colorado. And he, he, Steve is, a, is an insect mound and insect markings specialist. Everybody's got to have some narrow thing that they do. Steve has been known to find dinosaur, find insect tracks in dinosaur tracks on the North Slope in Alaska, working with a fellow from Dallas. So he knows his, he knows his insects. I have no doubt these are, are uh, termite mounds. If there are termite mounds, there has to be something that eats termites. A few years ago, over by Fruta, you can see J.G. Lowe and John Weibel published on a very small, this thing is eight centimeters long, that's like three inches, a little more than three inches. And it was a burrower, and they think that it was burrowing into some of the termite mounds. This jaw structure suggests that it actually was a termite or was an insect eater. Did it eat termites? Who knows? They're still working on that part of it. But it certainly was a mammal, a small mammal, that lived in, in uh, Colorado. Also found and useful to paleontologists who work with oil companies and paleontologists who are interested in really tiny things are caraphytes. They are, again, a biostratigraphic indicator they're found in the Morrison, and they are a form of freshwater green algae, so that if you find these structures in what you're looking at, and these are also microscopic, you can see the scale represents 0.4 millimeters, so these are smaller than a half a millimeter across, and the plant that they grew on, or the algae that they grew on, isn't like a scum algae, it's actually a branch-like algae, but the significance is that it's fresh water. So if you find these, you know you're not in, in marine beds. If we move into the Cretaceous, the Cretaceous is also very well known throughout the world. Colorado's Cretaceous is very well known throughout the world. And we can see Cretaceous fossils in Denver, a lot of people digging gardens in their backyard find Cretaceous fossils. Probably the most well-known Cretaceous fossils close to Denver we find up on Dinosaur Ridge. I mentioned that there is Morrison, Morrison dinosaurs. They're on the west side of the ridge. And if you go over on the east side, these are the overlying Cretaceous beds of the Dakota Formation. They don't have dinosaurs in them, but they have dinosaurs associated with them. 
on the west side, or on the east side, we see the dinosaur tracks. These are the, the, uh, the tracks for which Dinosaur Ridge is well known. There's over 400 tracks, mostly of iguanodon, the, the, the plant-eating dinosaurs that walk on their hind legs, and the theropods, which were the, the flesh-eating small dinosaurs. A lot of tracks along this, this trackway. Martin Lockley has mapped out the trackway. In fact, he was responsible back in the 1990s for exposing this portion of the trackway by removing the overburden. He got permission from Jefferson County and the state of Colorado to blast away and remove the overburden. So there's some fresh tracks that have been seen on the west side. The tracks on the east have been eroded since the 1930s, but the ones on the left are, are still pretty fresh. They're also on Dinosaur Ridge, as you walk up Alameda Parkway on the east side of the ridge, you can see these invertebrate ichnofossils. And we see this animal had a common burrow and it came out and went off in different directions, leaving little mounds behind. What it was, we don't know. It might have been a worm, might have been some crab-like creature or a beetle or something like that. What we do know is that it was living on the shallow seafloor. So we know that this was, at that time, a shallow part of the Western Interior Seaway. And the same on the right. These are markings made by worms that have crawled across the bottom of the, of the seaway. Also in the Cretaceous of Dinosaur Ridge, found just recently, I think in 1916 or uh, 2016 or 2015, Martin Lockley found these tracks and his interpretation of them is that they were made by the foot of a raptor. Now everybody knows Velociraptor from the Jurassic Park movies. These were made by a larger raptor, probably something like Utah raptor, which has been discovered in Dinosaur, actually, while they were making the uh, first Jurassic Park movie. And it has this significant large claw, which if you remember the, the Jurassic Park movie, it was clicking on the ground as it was chasing the children. This one didn't chase children, but it uh, made some casts, or there are some casts of its tracks on the west side of Dinosaur Ridge. There's now a, a display set aside that you can take a look at these, these tracks. Even more recently, Martin Lockley was working over in Utah and he found several of these scratch mark patterns. Obviously, they've been on Dinosaur Ridge since the 1930s, but no one paid any attention to them. He found a series of them in the Dakota over in Utah and found that they were spaced in an area that he thought might have ultimately been a brooding ground for some dinosaurs. And his current interpretation is that because birds are dinosaurs and birds often create a false neck, a false nest during their courtship, that perhaps something like Acrocanthosaurus that we see pictured here was making similar false necks to entice the ladies into their nesting area. Now there's only one that's really clear on Dinosaur Ridge, but the others are clear evidence of, of what he's talking about. It's new interpretation yet to be fully examined, but it makes it makes it interesting in that we're still finding new things on something that we've all walked by for many, many years. Associated with Dinosaur Ridge, up near Golden in the Laramie Formation, are the, the trackways or tracks from a Triceratops. Here you can see the toes of the Triceratops was headed in my direction and the, the trackway is called Ceratopsipes. Technically, and from a paleontological sense, legally, 
you can't say it's a Triceratops track because no one saw the Triceratops make it. And there were other Ceratopsian dinosaurs in the area. So Martin, when he finds tracks, has to give them new names. Now, Ceratopsipes is a pretty good clue as to what he thinks it probably was made from, but he has to give it a different name. There are also palm fronds exposed on the wall that is a part of what's called Triceratops Trail. And this is a part of the uh, Fossil Trace Golf Course up by Golden. You can see the entrance to this as you go up. I think it's Route 6 that goes up into, into Golden. George Daggett, who many of you know from his work here on the Mineral Show, George Daggett is a wanderer. And he, a few years ago, wandered north of Dinosaur Ridge, or what we know as Dinosaur Ridge, north of I-70, and he discovered this whole series of track sites, tracks that are here in what has become known as the Hawk Nest Dinosaur Track Site. It was named the Hawk Site Tres Dinosaur Site because there, of course, was a hawk nest with little hawks in it. But this has become well known to the rest of the world, as have the other tracks on Dinosaur Ridge, because George and Martin Lockley, and if I remember right, Beth Simmons, published these tracks out of New Mexico a few years ago. As you're driving into Morrison from the east side, if you're a passenger, look up. You will see an overhanging layer that has dinosaur tracks in it. This is what the overhanging layer looks like. This is a little detail of these iguanodontid type dinosaur tracks. So these are tracks that you're looking up at. Instead of being an impression, they were impressions that were filled with sandstone. So you're looking at the overlaying layer that filled the tracks. So there's dinosaurs all through the Denver area. If we go to the south, down at Red Rock Canyon, which has recently been turned into a city park, this belongs to the city of Colorado Springs, we can find that there are, there are cones of this plant called Ariacaria, and there are leaves, which in my mind look a little bit like willow leaves. I haven't had uh, Ian Miller take a look at these, and unfortunately, Ian's left us. He hasn't left us, he's moved to Washington. But you can see the number of specimens that are found in the Dakota Center, the number of taxa that are found in, in uh, the Dakota Formation down in Canyon Spring, Red Rock Canyon in Colorado Springs. Whoops, this one's out of place. Also down there we find iguanodonts and chylosaur and theropod tracks <clears throat> in, uh, that, that, that's, that's not in the Garden of the Gods. That's a slide that got misplaced. In the Garden of the Gods itself, north of Red Rock Canyon, just across uh, Highway 85, there was a skull found back in the late 1800s. And again, nobody paid much attention to it. And when they put the new visitor center in up at uh, Dinosaur, at uh, Garden of the Gods, they decided that they were going to have a cast of this. And in making the cast, Ken Tarpenter found out that it wasn't what Marsh said it was. It's a new dinosaur. And he and Kathy Brill gave it a name a few years ago. If we go into the late Cretaceous, we will find that there are some new things from near Denver. And these are, these are what, I, what I want to end with that back in the 1800, late 1800s, they found a specimen that was labeled a saurian tooth. It was found in 1873, which was 29 years before Barnum Brown found a dinosaur up in the Hell Creek of Montana that he called Dinomosaurus imperiosus. His boss, Henry Fairfield Osborne, did not like that name. So he renamed it. He called it Tyrannosaurus rex. 
So Tyrannosaurus rex, which was a specimen in the Yale Museum that nobody paid any attention to, Ken Carpenter found it in 2002, recognized it for what it was, and now has published it and told the world that the very first Tyrannosaurus rex wasn't Dinosaurus imperiosus, it was an unknown tooth found on Green Mountain. It was found near the junction of Jewel and Alameda, just on the, the southeast side of, of, uh, of Green Mountain. So if you go hiking on Green Mountain, keep your eyes open. There's more T-Rex up there, I'm sure. This is a specimen that was found in Lakewood and named by Marsh in 1887. He called it Bison alticornis. This is 1887. This was found near 6th Avenue and Lowell in Lakewood. It may have not even been the first of its kind found because a similar specimen was reported from Green Mountain earlier. But two years later, Marsh recognized what he had, but he had it from another area and he named it Triceratops. It really wasn't bison horns at all. It was Triceratops. Whoops. Comanche National Grasslands shows us the portion of the uh, Cretaceous beds in Colorado that aren't terrestrial. These are marine beds, and we find a lot of ammonites and this oyster, which looks for all the world like a bottle cap, and shark's teeth. So we had both the sea coming and going. This is the Western Interior Seaway, which comes and goes through Western Colorado. There are also other indicators of the marine beds that are, are present in the Cretaceous from that area. These are turtle tracks, which were found in the Dakota Sandstone down in Comanche National Grasslands by WIPS members who were on a field trip looking for dinosaur bones, dinosaur tracks. They also found some dinosaur tracks, and they also found some ichnofossils. This is the edge of a burrow of some kind of creature. Nobody's identified the creature. This is called the uh, rhizocorallium. And then every one of these trackways is given a name. Cruziana is one of my favorites. It's a track made by a trilobite scurrying along. Also, the waterway of Colorado shows us the Kremlin Ammonite site. This is one of the more significant localities in Colorado because it shows a variety of the sea life that lived here in the Western Interior Seaway. Placentisaurus is one of the more common. That's the center dinosaur. This is a, a mold where someone collected a dinosaur probably a number of years ago. And these are large ammonites. Most of them are about this big around. And they're there are enough of them there that the state of Colorado, the federal government actually, has set it aside as an area of preserve so that you and I can go up there and we can walk through this area and we can see, if not hundreds, we can see tens of these, these uh, ammonite impressions. So the seaway came and it went. This is where I'm going to stop. I think my time is about up. And Colorado... It's significant that Colorado has a number of firsts, but Colorado fossils have provided a lot of specimens for interpretation of what fossils are. Fossils, there's three things you have to be to be a fossil. One, you have to have been alive. Two, you have to have died. And three, you have to have been buried. Well, that's not totally true. You could have been frozen. But you have to be buried by either sediment or by ice. And once you find those fossils and the area, study the area around them, you can find out 
what the history of Colorado was like, and you can extrapolate that to the rest of the world. As one example, the Jurassic of Colorado has a near perfect match on the west side of Portugal. This young man named Octavio Matouche, who collects stegosaurs from Portugal. You look at the beds, they look for all the world like Dinosaur Ridge. The only difference is at the edge of the beds is the Atlantic Ocean. You can collect dinosaurs and watch the sunset, which you can't do here in Colorado. Thank you very much. <laughs>